Welcome everybody to the, today's uh, webinar about external tasks. Um, let me quickly start the slide so we can get started immediately. So, hang on a second. So, um, yeah, great. Um, maybe I want to give a, a quick introduction into myself that you know with talking uh, to you from the other uh, side of the computer. Uh, my name is Ben Drücker. I'm one of the uh, two founders of Camunda. I'm basically doing um, workflow, BPM, and all the um, surrounding um, topics for all my professional life. Um, you can reach out to me via, via Twitter, or via email, or whatever you prefer if you have any questions. My current role in um, Camunda is um, technology evangelist. So I'm basically traveling around a lot uh, to visit different customers to doing proof of concepts. Recently, um, we added a new chapter or basically two new chapters to our uh, real life BPMN book about the new standards CMMN and DMN. These are things um, um, I do and I'm doing, for example, webinars like today. Um, but it's not so much about me, it's about Camunda BPM today. I don't give an introduction into Camunda BPM today. Um, so there are regular webinars about um, Camunda BPM. So if you want to get an introduction into the overall platform, um, best register there and um, have a look there. For now, um, everything you have, to, I, or I think everybody knows in this webinar that Camunda BPM as an open source platform that you can execute different standards, the OMG standards BPMN2 for structured workflows, CMMN 1.1 for unstructured case management, and DMN for decision management, or, or if you want to call, call it business rules management. Today, we want to focus on um, BPMN, so on structured workflows. That's um, the example we want to tackle today in the webinar. So that could be a very easy order um, fulfillment process. It's actually maybe not the best order fulfillment process in the world. So I, um, I look through the participants of today and I think a couple of you might already laugh about that process because you, you, you do that much more complex, but it's, it's perfectly fine for today's use case. So imagine we get a new order, then um, we might have to reserve some goods that we can send it um, to the customer later on. So we want to make sure they are on stock. Then we um, create an invoice so that um, we can maybe directly send as a PDF to the customer. Then we um, create the shipment. It is on some stock. Um, it might happen that the goods is missing anyway. So that shouldn't happen, but that's reality. And um, if we created the shipment, then we inform the customer that we basically just sent the order. So that's a very easy process, I think. So I hope um, everybody can follow that. So if you look at that um, BPMN process, and if you um, imagine how we um, basically see the traditional way of calling services in Camunda. That means with every service task or send task, you basically attach some Java code. So um, it, it might be also some scripting code or it might be a bean, like, like a spring bean or, or a CDI named bean or whatever it is. But in the end, it's always Java code. So um, if you don't know Camunda too much, um, this is how it normally looks like. So you have a piece of Java code, which is called when a workflow instance basically passes the service task. And within that code, you normally do, um, every time you do the same thing, you, you get some variables, some data from the process, from the workflow instance. Um, then you basically look up some, some service endpoint you want to call. Then you call the service. Um, and you get some result and then you maybe um, want to want to save the result somewhere in the process. So um, abstractly speaking, that's some kind of input mapping you have. So from the data from the process to the data you need for the service call, you have an output mapping, you have the service call and you might have a service. Call. So that's what I would say 95% of the projects out there do um, today um, with service orchestration in Camunda. It's so basically um, that kind of um, um, push principle. So basically the engine um, tells everybody what they should do. So that's the basic idea behind um, workflow execution. The engine um, is the orchestrator and um, it always says, okay, do this, do that. And the direction of communication is normally from the engine 
um, to the service call. Okay. Um, technology wise, what I said normally, John. That's actually pretty good. So we, we, we have that for, um, 15 years now in, in various engines on the way, um, done in a lot of projects. So that's a great thing to do actually, because it's very easy to understand. Every Java developer normally understands that immediately. You can get started very quickly, uh, at least if you know Java. Um, and then you can basically do whatever you want. It's easy to call um, own Java code. It's easy to call any other technology because Java normally has a framework um, to call other technologies like web services, REST or SOAP or, or messaging or um, FTP or whatever it is. So um, there's a framework available for sure. And something, uh, um, yeah, at least some or maybe many customers did in the past. They um, used some kind of transactional coupling um, between the Kamunda workflow engine and the services may be written in, in Java in an EJB, for example, because then it can, can um, combine that in one transaction. Um, so there are a couple of advantages of this approach, but um, we, over the time, we basically um, saw more and more situations where this doesn't fit very well. And um, in the beginning, we actually always made it fit. <laughs> so uh, we said, this is our hammer and, and, and that works perfectly, perfectly well for your problem. Um, but we, uh, over the last one or two years, actually, we discovered more and more use cases and they got more and more common, um, that we said we have to do something about that. Um, and there are a couple of limitations of the current approach. So for example, um, if you have, um, a service call, um, you might have, um, done what I showed earlier. So you might have. Um, Java code being called and that if you look at it how the engine executes that internally and um, that means um, we basically block um, the um, um, threat of the process engine in order to call um, or to execute the Java code we do here um, and we block until everything is done within the um, Java code um, when everything is done that's the first um, point where we can basically commit the state to the database. And if you know how timers work in Kamunda, um, they are only working if the state is already committed in the database because we're pulling that from the database. And to make a long story short, um, if you call synchronous services here with Java, the timer will never work, okay? You might have not understood why in my, my very brief explanation, and it actually doesn't matter, but um, the thing is that it's not very intuitive that, it, that way. You see basically um, implementation details from what we have in the engine um, here when, when using that in, 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 in BPMN with that timer. And that's a very good example where we have a lot of questions, why is that not working? Um, again, I. I, we see very big advantages of having that transactional behavior we have in the engine, um, but there are a lot of situations where, where it's maybe not the best um, behavior you want to have. Um, another thing you um, sometimes have, um, you have the problem that with this approach, you have to know the endpoint of the service you're calling. So if you call, for example, an SAP system or an Oracle Siebel system or some ESB or a SOAP web service, you always have to know the address um, of that service to call. Um, in some kind of SOA environment that might be a service registry um, I'm giving you that, but actually in most of the projects, I never saw a proper service registry. So that normally means you have to somehow configure the list of endpoints. You have to do that um, differently in a test environment, in a stage environment, in the production environment. Um, you have one place where you know a lot of endpoints about a lot of things about your services, which might not be um, um, the best approach actually to tackle it. It works pretty well in um, in SOA kind of scenarios and it works pretty well for smaller scenarios, but it's um, obviously maybe a downside of this approach. One thing which is very um, uh, obvious maybe, or, or for, for me it's completely obvious, but um, we also got the question more often in, in, in support. Um, if you have a long running um, service, 
Like for example, we have customers doing um, um, video transcoding. So that might even take 10 or 12 hours to transcode a big um, video file. Um, then you cannot call that in a synchronous service from the Java world, because if you do this, um, you run into a lot of timeouts in a transaction timeout, in a um, uh, servlet timeout, in whatever it is. So there are a couple of timeouts um, you will definitely run into. So that's not possible to call that directly with that push principle. So what you normally do is you um, change that in your process to basically to just tell the service to do something and then wait for the completion, um, which is perfectly valid and working, but that means um, you have to do something additional here. So for example, you have to collect the result and, um, um, and add that um, a response channel um, or whatever it is. So you have to do something additional, which maybe could be um, easier uh, made for you guys. Um, I come back to all these examples later, how that changes with um, external tasks, but that um, I, I want you to understand the motivation we had um, when doing this. Okay, so that's another use case, um, which doesn't work that well. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I think everybody here can imagine a failed service. So you call um, some of your whatever order data service and in the background, the database of that service is down and that service is failed or, or maybe the network connection goes down or whatever. So things fail at some time. And that means, I mean, um, on the, on the Kamunda uh, side of the story, we have a couple of mechanisms to deal with that. So we can do, for example, a retrying. So we can hook in a retry strategy and say, okay, if that service is not available, um, I retry it, um, whatever, 10 times with a delay of one minute in between. So um, when the service comes back up again, um, the process instance, the workflow instance recovers and moves on without anybody um, having to do something manual. That's a great thing so far. But um, if you think about huge scenarios, so not, not the small company, but really huge scenarios, um, what might happen here is that if a service goes down, uh, we put the service even under more load because we're doing all the retries all the time. And then it might even happen that it come, if it comes back up, um, you do a denial of service attack yourself because you have so many um, and processes doing the retry that you, you flooded with requests. Um, or maybe not that drastic. What you sometimes also want to do is, um, if the service um, failed, um, you want to want to start it up and then you want to want to do one request at a time because you're not yet sure if the service is really working again. And you want to want to check the first five, six, seven requests really manually to see that everything is working be before you get the huge load onto it. Okay. And this is actually, um, not that easy to do with the current architecture. You can do it, so you could, um, and that's already um, um, the next slide, so you could um, suspend services in the um, in the Kamunda universe. You might know that, so that the um, pause symbol in, in cockpit you see here, so you can say, okay, this service task, I wanna, wanna pause it, I wanna suspend it. Um, then we will not do any service requests here. And then you can, um, for example, in cockpit, look up single workflow instances and resume them. And then they um, will run um, run through. And then you can do that one by one thing um, pretty well, actually. The, um, the problem you have here is that the granularity is not on the service. So you might have um, 10 processes. All of them are reserving goods on stock, so they call the same service. Then you have to suspend all the 10 service tasks in the different processes. So you cannot suspend the service. You always suspend the service tasks. Um, so the BPMN um, 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 elements, basically. And that means it's a bit more complicated, actually, to achieve. So you cannot just say, I have a resource service A and I suspend. We have customers, for example, doing um, some additional logic like querying all the um, 
what we call job definitions, see what you can suspend. They have a naming convention, so they search for everything, which is, for example, starting with warehouse, and then they um, um, suspend them um, in one batch. Um, so that's possible to do, but you need quite some additional logic in order, order to achieve that. Um, another um, thing, um, when you think about scalability, when you, um, uh, in, the, in the current approach, that means, okay, I have my uh, process engine, my workflow engine, Kamunda, and then I want to call um, a service which is maybe clustered up to, um, in this case, three instances. Um, that normally means that you have load balancer in between, so we don't have any load balancing um, um, features directly on board, and that depends very much on the on the protocol used here. So, for example, with REST, you have very easy load balances typically. Um, so you have to add them on your own. Um, that's normally not a big problem because that's solved in typical architectures we we see out there. Um, a uh, more tricky thing actually is to do the other way around, to do throttling. So um, what do I mean with throttling? That means, for example, if you have a service which you can call only with one request at a time. So that means you cannot go with three parallel requests at the service. That sometimes that are very, very um, old legacy services which can just not handle parallel requests. Sometimes um, these are licensing issues. So we have a lot of third-party components out there which are licensed only for one um, parallel thread and then you have to throttle that in order to to make that happen. And that's actually very hard to do currently in, in Kamunda BPM because then you have to hook in an own implementation for the um, job executor. Um, so that's theoretical possible and I know customers doing that but it's actually very hard to maintain nothing you want to want to easily do so um, it's, it might be even easier to implement something in the middle where you do the throttling yourself you have to again write additional code in order to achieve that so that's maybe not the nicest situation um, other thing we we see out there is that we get more and more polyglot um, 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 users so it's not everything is Java so uh, um, I mean, it's very easy to call code in other languages. Um, I mean, um, it might be a REST service, might be SOAP service, might be something else, but it's always very easy to do technically. But in the current architecture, um, it normally involves writing Java code on the Kamunda platform. And we have customers um, which are not familiar with Java. So for example, the .NET customers, they are normally have a lot of .NET know-how, but they don't have Java know-how, um, and they don't want to build that for for um, the BPM and processes. So that's not very nice um, that you have to know Java. And another um, use case which comes up more and more often if you want to run a workflow engine in the cloud, which I think is easily um, imaginable today, and this workflow um, should call on-premise services, so the services are hosted within um, your own company, so within your own network, like an SAP system, a Siebel system, or your own ESB, or, or um, homegrown, um, whatever applications. So um, you need to call them in order to um, execute a, a workflow. And that's normally not easy, because with a push channel, that means you need a channel from the from the web normally. If that's not a private cloud, then it gets easier. But it's in a public cloud, that means you need a channel from the web into um, your own premise. And that's, um, I mean, it's 2016. It should be like VPN or, or SSH tunnels or whatever um, is out there should work. But actually, that's normally a big pain um, you face. So that's not working that well. So um, that basically was about motivation where um, um, yeah, basically over the last two years, we started to think about that more and more and said, hey, that's maybe um, not the best hammer we have there for the problems we see and for the changing um, world we see. So um, we did a couple of um, pilot projects in the beginning um, using simple user tasks for um, service calls, basically. So the idea was, the think thinking was, um, we treat a system like a human. I mean, it's an automated human, but kind of a human. And we basically just place tasks 
for the system and the system can get all the tasks um, it can execute at the moment and reports completion. So this is how human tasks works, right? You you put the human task into the task list, um, um, the user picks it up and then it clicks on a complete button, for example, and the process moves on. And we said, hey, that's actually a pretty good idea also for, for services, for systems. Um, this is what external tasks are. So um, for example, if you have that process, it's a different process at the moment. Um, if you want to transcode the, that very large video of what I mentioned earlier, which takes maybe 12 hours, um, you don't call some service out there, but you have a worker and it actually doesn't matter in which language you write that worker, it might be in any language um, you can think of, um, that worker can fetch um, tasks from Kamunda um, and report completion later on. We can also report failure, um, we see that. In okay. The only thing we have to make sure in order to scale up here is that we also lock tasks we, we fetch. Um, and this is why the method is called fetch and lock. And um, we have something you could imagine that like a small queue internally, um, which is basically just a name you provide for every external task in order to fetch the work in order to have a clear identity of um, which service you want to call. And we call that topic name. So you have to provide a topic name and this is how it looks in the model. We, we look at it in a live scenario in a minute. Okay, and that's the whole idea. So basically we have an external worker doing all the stuff and we are not calling um, anything um, actively. The API is very straightforward. So API means as always in the Kamunda platform, the API is available as Java API or as REST API. So I um, reference the um, the REST API here. I'm pretty sure you will find that yourself easily. So the first thing um, you normally do is patch and lock. And after some time, you might complete the task. So that's the um, perfect way of doing stuff. If you um, if you face some uh, something um, business related, like an error, like um, what I mentioned earlier, that the um, goods are not on stock, then you can um, handle a BPMN error. So um, erase a BPMN error, so you can handle that in the um, BPMN process. Or if you um, if you see some technical things going on or, or not going on, basically you can um, report a failure, and um, that means there is something technically broken. And when handling a failure, you can tell um, the Kamunda engine um, if a retry should be attempted or not. So you could say, okay, um, it didn't work at the moment, but retry it 10 times and wait for five minutes. So the worker can say that itself. Okay, so it's not configured in the BPMN process like with the active push, but it's um, the, um, basically the worker tells us um, how we should handle retry. And that's basically the API. So it's pretty simple to get, I guess. So what are the advantages? So let's quickly go over that and then we jump in a, in a live example. <clears throat> so we basically change the direction of communication. So the service now gets the work and that changes a lot of things. So long running services is not a problem because we can say fetch and lock, that's an atomic operation, no timeouts here. Then the worker can do whatever it does. Um, and after 12 hours, he says complete, perfectly fine. No problems here. Um, <clears throat> One thing I wanted to make clear actually at that point is that there is no misunderstanding. Um, this doesn't mean that you now have to whatever um, tweak your um, shell, whatever program um, which did the video encoding in order to get the requests. Um, so what normally is done is that you, you write a, a small dedicated worker which then calls your, your own service and, and does the communication with the Kamunda platform. And this can still be done in any technology. It could be a shell service, why not? <clears throat> a shell script. Um, but it's then completely under your control. It's normally a very small piece of code. We will see that um, for different technology as an example um, in a minute. Okay, so that's a great thing. Um, okay, if, the, if there's a failure in the service, we can um, and report that. That's what you saw in the API. Um, you don't have actually to suspend any service tasks in Kamunda BPM because you can just shut down the service. If the service is shut down, 
um, nothing will happen. So we will not actively call it. We will not put it under load. Um, you can completely decide when you bring it up again and how much tasks you will fetch then. So you could maybe in a first step only fetch one task. Um, so that's very easy to do. You do it on the granularity of the service, not on the BPMN service task, which might be multiple ones using the same service. So that's um, actually um, easier. Um, you can scale basically as you like. So you have much more scaling possibilities without um, um, the Comuna engine or the BPMN process being affected. So if you want to do, for example, the throttling I mentioned earlier, then you just have one um, worker um, with one thread getting one task at a time and calling the service. So you um, limited the request to one. Very easy to do. Um, you can run as much workers as you want. So you can scale up here on different nodes if you like, no problem. Um, or you can still, if you have your um, load balancing already in place, you can do a worker then going over the load balance or you can mix the stuff. So you're, you're very flexible in what you're um, doing there. Um, if you're getting, or if you're polyglot, it, it means you don't have to write a Java adapter in order to call services, but um, you basically query the REST API from Kamunda and REST is normally not, not a problem in, in, um, in any, uh, of these technologies. So a, a, anybody can talk HTTP and, um, 2016 anyway. Um, yeah. Um, last remark at the, at this point. So, um, um, also for, for cloud scenarios, that makes much more sense because now the direction of communication is more natural to how the internet works. So you have something central, um, in, in, in the internet in a public cloud and you have something on premise and then you talk actively to the thing in the, in the, in, in the internet. You do that with the secure channel. I mean, that's technically easy, but um, I'm calling REST services. That's um, very easy to achieve. Okay. And the cloud service does not even have to know where you are from. So that's very easy to, to do. The transactional behavior also changes. So um, one thing which might not be um, so obvious here, but this timer now works as expected. So there are a couple of smaller things um, in the surroundings of external tasks, which are really interesting because now um, it means we run into the service task. Then we commit to the database because we make this the, the task for the external worker available. Um, and at that point, we create the timer. The timer is in the database and the timer will fire. Okay. So this works perfectly well, as you might have expected. Um, in the first place anyway. Um, there are a couple of other things um, easier with that approach. So um, one thing or the last thing I want to mention here to not um, bore you with too many, um, and maybe already very in-depth um, um, typical problems, but this is very common actually. We see that quite regularly at customers. So what do they do? Um, if they do service orchestration, they might send a request um, to whatever system. Um, let's say this is a SOAP web service. That's very typical, actually. So that's a SOAP web service. The service does whatever it does and blocks the SOAP, um, SOAP call because it does that synchronously. But for some reason, I normally do not understand, but um, um, sometimes it makes sense, but a lot of times also not. <laughs> but uh, anyway... Um, for some reason, this service um, responds in an asynchronous way, for example, via a JMS message. Okay. In this case, um, you're blocking um, the BPMN um, execution in the Camunda engine um, when sending the JMS message. When you send the JMS message here, it's it's put on the queue, and then you might get uh, you might give the control back, and only then the process instance can move on until it re um, it it reaches the wait state, and then it commits to the database. And only if it has committed to the database, it's what we call ready to receive um, to get the um, um, answer message. 
if the JMS message is delivered very fast, and in most situations, that's faster than actually giving back the threat and committing. That depends very much on a lot of things, but um, it might be faster. Um, or even more strange, this sometimes it's even a synchronous callback that doesn't make any sense anymore, but um, we see that out there. And that means there's no process instance yet waiting. And that then you get an error. And this is very, um, for, a lot, for, for most of the people, hard to understand in the beginning why this is not working. And these are things which um, we see and support more and more um, coming, especially with um, service orchestration. So for external service tasks, that can never happen. If you have an external service task, um, we do one commit, and only after that commit, um, the external worker can get the task. So it's always already um, ready um, to um, complete the work and to move on. So this can never happen in the scenario with an external server task, external um, service task. So um, yeah, as you can see, I'm, I'm quite um, quite a big fan of external tasks, but I can put a big, uh, come come back to that later. Um, so we already have half an hour gone without any code. That already too much time without code. So um, let's quickly jump into um, um, the demo I want to give. So that's basically the process we saw earlier. So I have um, that small order received, uh, ordered um, um, process. The first thing I want to do is reserve goods on stock. That's what I showed you earlier. So what I do in order to make that external, I um, select not Java class, I select external, and then I have to provide only the topic. I don't have to do more here. So I just say research goods. I deployed that in the background. So I have a small wildfly running here. I deployed the process. So it's there, right? Um, when I have that, what I can do is actually to go to my web tooling, login. And then I can, for example, start an order process. Um, that's just for demo purposes. So normally you would start that via service call as well, but I want to make it very easy. Okay. I just want to have one process started, but hang on a second. We had a variable so we can see something. I just say, okay, there's some order and that might be, um, yeah, whatever it is, might be a JSON string, whatever it is. Um, now I can go to cockpit. Let's check, um, what do we have? Just do a, Refresh, so I have my two processes I just started. I want to actually kill the older one in order to not get confused. <laughs> so I just um, cancel it, so it gets deleted. So it's gone. So now I have one process instance waiting in the reserve goods on stuff. Mm, now I can query that via REST API. Okay, I could do that now via plain REST API. I actually thought that would be a bit too boring. So what I did is actually I wrote some, where is it, some JavaScript. That's what I always do if I, <laughs> no, I don't want to get into details there. I'm not the biggest fan of writing JavaScript, but anyway, you can do cool stuff with that. So what I did, I uh, wrote a small HTML page. Um, I did just include bootstrap for the layout and jQuery in order to um, um, to do HTTP requests. And then on that button you see um, there, when I click on the button, what happens in the background, it's basically that call that receive external task method. Um, and that sends a request to our REST API. So I say fetch and lock. That's what I mentioned earlier. I give some um, information with me. So um, that's a worker ID that would be unique for every worker if you scale that up. So if you have 10 different um, um, nodes running, um, all of them have different worker IDs. So you can um, directly, you know, which worker took the task. You say how many tasks you want to have in one batch. So um, it might be that you process them very fast. And then the um, network overhead of fetching tasks is bigger than the processing. And then it makes very much sense to batch um, these tasks. So you could say like, give me 1000, I process 1000 at a time. Okay. You can also say one, I mean, um, it works as well. Um, then you tell him um, the topics you're interested in. Normally that's one, but it might be multiple ones. 
um, you specify um, the lock time. So that's the time in milliseconds you have um, to complete the task. If you don't complete it within that time, um, it's basically free again to get catched by a different worker because then we assume that this worker died. Okay. So you have to make that big enough in order to finish the work you're doing there. And you can specify which process variables, which data of the workflow instance you're interested in. So in this case, the order variable, I just um, appended it. Then I um, do a post request to the patch and lock. Um, and over that request. And what I get back is a result, which is a list of um, uh, external tasks. So if you're interested, um, best look in the um, REST API. So let's look at the REST API. And then you see there's a resource external task. There's a fetch and lock um, method. So that's exactly what I did here. That's which I always look at the example. I do not read the code too often. So that's the body I sent over. And then as a response, you get a list of um, external tasks. Okay, um, sorry, an array. <laughs> it's a JavaScript word. Um, let's do that. Um, oh yeah, and then I basically just go through the array, um, lock that on the JavaScript console. Let's show the console that we can see something. And then I post uh, complete. Um, so external task with the idea uh, slash complete. So um, then the process instance will move on because we have done the work and we might hand over them additional data with the complete. Let's quickly cook a look at that as well. So uh, that's exactly what I do. And in the body, I could hand over variables when, for example, if I calculated something or if I want to provide a result or whatever. I just didn't do that in that case. So let's click the button to do that. On the console, I have not opened the console in the right tab, so I don't have the console. But however, um, what I do is I add the um, JSON of the um, external task in the table. So we see that here. Um, but it's actually not that thrilling. So I, I get some external task. You see the process instance ID. You see the lock time. Um, which process, uh, how many retries, the worker ID, the topic name, the variables you requested, and these kind of things. We have a priority and we have introduced tenant IDs with the 7.5. So everything you need is there in, in the external task objects you get. So when I did the complete, what I can see in my cockpit is if I refresh, um, it moved on. So it's now in the create invoice state. Let's quickly look at the create invoice from the BPMN process. Same thing, external create invoice. Very easy. But there I actually used uh, different technology and uh, my latest um, toy is actually .NET. So I'm programming C Sharp a lot in the last uh, month. Um, also because we have a lot of customers coming with, um, from .NET environments and um, not want to program Java code, and I mean, it's a very valid use case. And in this case, um, I wrote, for example, a worker for the create invoice in C sharp. Um, that's now maybe a tricky one because you might ask yourself, okay, that's um, what is this attribute? What's the interface? What are you doing there? And if you see that, there's a um, Kamunda client worker um, task adapter. What is that? And um, what I did there is I basically wrote a, sh a small sh uh, a showcase for .NET. And there I developed a small class library, which basically abstracts all the REST communication with Kamunda. And what it also does, um, I have a small, um, so that's a console application. I, when I started that in a minute, it's just a console, so it's not fancy. Um, Windows Forms or whatever, um, it's just a console. Um, and when starting up, it basically scans the class path for um, all external task topics. And then it creates a thread um, which constantly polls for external task via the REST API. 
And when it fetches some tasks, it calls for every task that execute method. Okay, that's some code I have written, so that's not um, provided by Kamuna in, Kamuna in any way, but um, you can see that you can very easily write some glue code in order to make work with external task work is very convenient. So what you see here is basically it looks like a Java delegate in the Java world, but you only have to write C sharp code. Okay, so that's actually pretty cool and, and I like that a lot. Um, so if I start the um, console, so what you can also already see, it registered the task workers. It executed our external task, so a new invoice was created. So great, hey, hooray. So you see a lot of things happen in the background. And um, let's quickly check the cockpit. Okay, so we are now into create ship. Um, I wanted to do actually a, another technology, but I was too um, too lazy to do something very fancy. So I basically did Java because Java is what I can do best. And so I created an on servlet. Okay, that's a very easy servlet. And I basically did that because then I can also show you the Java um, API for the external tasks. So what I do there, I um, get my process engine. From the engine, we have an so-called external task service. There we can say the same thing as with the REST API. We can say fetch and lock, give me 10 tasks. I'm the Java worker um, M01. And then um, I want the topic create shipment, um, lock it for um, two seconds. Yeah, do it. So I get a list of tasks and then I go over the list of tasks and basically external task service, complete that. Okay, we come back to that in a second. So that's very easy as well. And let's quickly do that. So where is it here? So I basically hooked in um, the servlet just on the URL and it created an, or it um, created a shipment. So if we go back to cockpit, you already might get the idea we moved on. And ah, actually that's interesting. So no process instance running anymore. Why? Because the informed customer was again a .NET task and I still have the, um, where's the map there? I have the C sharp thing running. So the email was sent to the customer already. And that means if we look at the history, we can still be the process instance. So um, that one ended. Um, and again, you can see all the audit log information. So how long did that take? How long did that take? And that's, by the way, a very interesting thing because um, um, you can still do in Camune, you can do um, like SLA um, and monitoring. I mean, um, you see how long do you wait until a worker picks it up or completes it. So that's a great tooling as well. Okay. So that's uh, already most of it. Let me quickly show you a, a, a second thing and then we are almost done. Um, I did something which I would not advise to do actually in, in, in real life projects, but um, you know, I'm as a technology evangelist, I'm uh, perfectly allowed to play around with what we have in order to achieve what I want to achieve very easily. And so I, um, I modeled a BPMN process, um, which basically spawns a second um, um, token, which does an infinite loop. Wait some time, create some new order processes, wait some time and so on and so on. There's a small Java delegate doing some random numbers and starting processes and so on um, until I complete that task because then everything is done. So that's, I mean, BPMN wise, completely valid. It's running. Um, it doesn't make so much sense in, uh, uh, as a use case. However, if I go back to my, um, cockpit, I see that this guy should have done some work, right? I have 123 um, workflow instances running here. So let's stop this guy. Okay, so we have some, some load here. So the reserve goods on stock was our JavaScript thing. So where is that? There. We can, if you like, we can open up the console this time. But, um, you just see the objects passing by. So um, you see, okay, there's, if you look at this scroll bar, you see we always get 50 new, and at some point it stops. We don't get 
any more tasks because since we have um, done all of them. Ah, the create invoice, that's already almost done. You saw 18, now it's passed because we still have the C-sharp worker running. So that's C-sharp one is a very productive one. Um, we don't have the um, Java service running at the moment. So we have to uh, quickly make that bigger here. So we have to call that servlet again in order to execute that worker. Um, and that does 10 um, tasks at a time. But, and that's an interesting thing, um, for 10 tasks, it says one will actually go that way because we um, create a BPMN failure. So that's what you saw here. So for um, eight of them, uh, we start with zero, of course. So for eight of them, um, we complete normally. For one, we handle that BPMN error. So um, we say there, we have the error goods not available. And for one, we handle a failure um, where we say, um, basically that's interesting here. So um, we have retries and the um, retry, it's basically waiting time, timeout, timeout might not be the best name, but um, how long do we wait until the next retry and the number of retries left? Okay. Um, so that means I always have one which fails and should do a retry. Um, so if you're good in math, that means if I do that, I execute 10 workers. Um, if I refresh here, it should mean that I have 124 instances here because one is still here because we have to do the retry. We have one here and we should have eight added here, which means nine instances. Hooray, that's already pretty good. Okay. Yeah, and this one is always working, right? That's our C sharp guy that's doing a lot of work. Um, yeah. And this is how it looks in the heat map. Because I, I always like to show the heat map actually or, or some of the KPIs. But whatever. Um, that's actually not our topic from today. Um, so that's basically um, um, it from the from from the demo. I hope that helped a bit to to understand um, how external tasks work. Um, I don't want to go over the summaries. I mean, we talked a lot about the um, um, advantages, so I I hope they are they are pretty obvious. Um, there's one thing I wanted to uh, tell about the future here. So at the moment we don't have a committed roadmap. But what does that mean? So we introduce external tasks like they are at the moment in 7.5. So they are there, they are supported, they're in the product, so you can use them. And um, we already have a lot of projects using them. Um, we have things in the pipe, but um, currently we haven't committed on any issue yet that we say, okay, this will be for sure in 7.6, which will be released end of um, November, or in 7.7, which will be released end of May in 2017. So we have these fixed release cycles every half a year, and we haven't yet locked any um, additional feature um, to a specific version. So that means it, it might come something or it might not. <laughs> um, so that uh, for us, it's always important to get feedback on these things. So if you, for example, if you're an enterprise customer and you say, okay, this functionality is great, but I need um, a, a, certain, a certain tiny bit um, added there in order to use it really productive, the best is to open up a support case because then um, um, we get that feedback and you're able to monitor the progress. Um, if you're no enterprise customer, um, first of all, you should get one. Um, and second of all, you can still um, um, vote issues in, in, in Jira or you can uh, talk to us on the forum on these kind of things. So we are definitely interested in feedback. Um, there are a couple of things um, we already know which might be interesting to change in future. So for example, one very interesting um, thing is already an issue um, created for it to extend the lock time. So the idea is um, if I'm an external worker, maybe doing video encoding for 12 hours, um, I don't want to lock a task for, let's say, 24 hours because I don't know how much time the worker will need. And then it dies after one minute. That's a bit crappy, right? Because then I wait 24 hours until I retry it. So the idea is to, to lock it only for, let's say, one minute or five minutes. 
and have some kind of live beep every one minute, um, extend the lock for another minute. And this, um, by this, you make sure that the worker is still alive because if it's not alive, the lock will be um, released. So that's actually um, a quite interesting one. Um, we might have more cockpit support. So a couple of things with external tasks are not yet visible completely in cockpit. Um, we have a pull request for our camel community extension being able to, um, to use um, external service tasks. That's um, actually something we have to review. Um, still, I think the author of it is in the webinar. So I'm, I'm sorry for, for being late on that, but. Uh, Having quite some work to do lately, and um, it's also maybe thinkable that there might be um, language clients, maybe as community extensions. But still, I mean that's very valuable. So, for example, C Sharp and JavaScript are are languages that are asked very often. Um, and yeah, to, to maybe to summarize it, for I think that's a very promising concept for the future. So, um, because we're, we're the world is changing, and it's um, basically. Uh, no longer tied to these um, um, three-tier architectures we know from the path where we have EJBs, where we have JTA, um, where we do service calls we did um, the last 15 years. So um, requirements are changing and then external tasks are really, really good answers. So I think they get more and more important in, in the future, um, um, basically of workflow orchestra and service orchestration. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the take phase for you. So external tasks are great. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, there's a deal behind it. Uh, they're a bit more complex, so it might be easier to just do a Java delegate. Um, but also you're more flexible and, um, and have more scalability patterns and more operating patterns. So it's a good thing to know about it. And then you should still decide wisely um, on what to use, which you should always do. Um, yeah, so that's um, basically that it from me. Um, so we can get in the uh, in the in the Q and A, and I actually have to check the um, the chat window in order to to get um, your questions. So give me um, um one second. And if you have questions, um, um, don't hesitate to ask them. Just type them in the chat window. I will try to answer them. And one thing I actually forgot to say in the beginning, um, which I should have said in the beginning, but of course there will be a recording available of the whole webinar later on. So um, uh, don't worry about that. Okay, there was one um, question about why not using um, normal JMS messages. So I think that's um, um, here um, on that slide. So why? not basically just put a JMS message in a queue um, and then just use JMS. Um, that's actually what a lot of people today do, um, especially in order to um, to avoid these kind of problems. Um, but the downside of it is that you have an additional component. You have to have a JMS provider. Um, I saw in a lot of companies that they are not or how do they say that nicely, but they are not under full control of JMS. So very often a good monitoring is missing. They have problems with dead messages or lost messages. Um, sometimes messaging is, um, yeah, it's kind of, a, kind of a pain. So it might be easier to run without an additional messaging infrastructure, um, especially if you don't have one yet. So that's an additional complexity. And still, um, it's Java. So for all use cases where you don't have Java, that's not a not a not a good good answer. So I would argue if you have a good JMS message implementation in place, if you have a great monitoring for you for that, if you trust your JMS implementation completely, um, then that's a good alternative to use. Um, I haven't seen that in quite a while. <laughs> so um, in most of the projects, we make better experiences with basically replacing JMS with um, what we can do there. Um, so let me go to the next question. Um, well, that's a longer one. Sorry, I have to read for a second. Um, okay, so the um, question is, what is um, if Kamuna um, is down, basically? So what happens if... Um, if your worker is running, but the Kamuna engine is down, which um, 
if you scale that correctly, it should not happen actually. Um, but uh, anyhow, if the Kamuna engine is down, um, it basically means that this worker cannot fetch any work and it cannot complete any work or it cannot report completion of work. And that's maybe um, the most tricky issue here. So um, um, you cannot fetch any work. Okay, that's not a big deal. Then you have to wait until it comes back. If you have done work, like um, what we said earlier, like the 12 hours transcoding and you want to want to um, complete the work and the um, engine is not there. Um, yeah, it depends on the implementation of your worker. I think it might be a good idea to actually to have some kind of um, whatever kind of queuing in, in the worker then. It's um, what I meant earlier, the worker is under your control, so you're free to do whatever you want to do there. Um, yeah, that's basically my answer to that. Um, in this scenario, I would um, 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 I would see Camunda as a kind of middleware. So normally uh, the availability of middleware should be very high. So that should not be a, a big deal. We are currently working on um, also on scenarios with um, the what do you call the five niners of availability. So in the telecommunication space, we have that very often. Um, we are doing stuff like um, rolling upgrades, so we can um, upgrade even the engine version without um, shutting it down or we're working on these kind of things. So um, it's possible actually to get a very high availability with the, with the engine. So then this should not happen. Um, there is um, one question I have to read. <laughs> okay, there are two questions um, in one. Well, the first one is maybe interesting for everybody. Um, the question was, when was this um, history um, um, things are introduced in cockpit um, because um, the guy doesn't have that or doesn't know that. And that's actually an enterprise feature. So um, there are a couple of things, um, like if you're interested in detail, the best is to check. Um, so the product edition. So there you have the comparison between community and enterprise edition. And there you see there's an enterprise cockpit and the enterprise cockpit has a couple of things additionally. Okay. And this is why you might not know, um, um, um these history features because they are in the enterprise cockpit only. Okay. So that's the easy part of the question. And the second part of the question, I think, is to, um, um, I'm not completely sure if it's related to this one because it was, um, why not make the first call non-blocking? So it might be this one um, where you're referring to. So the idea was why not make this call non-blocking? Um, and this would be actually a very good idea in this scenario to solve um, the problem. So you could have, for example, a JMS queue here in between. So that would perfectly solve the problem. Um, the just the thing is that um, a lot of projects, they don't have JMS. They might even not know about JMS. And they, um, especially they don't ha run it in production. So they just don't want to introduce that for, for um, that requirement. That's our current answer, or that was the basic answer in support before. And we had the external task as well, was basically, OK, use something um, asynchronous here like JMS. Um, Maybe one last question. Um, I have a couple of them. Okay, there, there was a question. If we monitor if a worker is still alive, and that's um, actually, um, um, I could put that on this slide. So um, we don't have an active monitoring in the sense that we monitor if we get regular fetch and lock requests from a, from a client. Um, however, you see um, 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 that the, we get more and more tasks. Uh, the tasks, um, we have a creation date, you might have um, some additional things, so you can monitor it indirectly. Very easy today, but it, it could be that um, um, we add something there that you directly get an alarm, okay, um, this um, worker should um, fetch and lock every one minute, and it didn't do that, 
so um, we raise an incident or whatever, but um, we don't have that yet. Um, but it's actually not a big deal at the moment. Um, so one very last question, because that was um, two times. And what will happen if a number of retries is exhausted? So um, this is um, what happens all the time in, in Kamunda. If we don't have any retries anymore, what we create is a so-called incident. So you get um, basically on the um, uh, on this view, you get a red light. So if something um, is broken here, you get that here as well. You can very easily filter for that. And then you can go into the process instance and you see um, also um, red um, marker here and you see the incident with the error message and all that so you can as an operator you can look into the into incident see what's wrong there in order to um, to fix that and uh, uh, get going so um, we are basically out of time um, so um, we have a couple of questions left open I know that I'm sorry for that but um, if there Anything you need to know urgently, I mean, um, get in touch with us, either um, with, the, with the company, if, for example, you um, you saw the history cockpit and uh, think that I, I, I need to have that, or um, you might have heard about the enterprise edition and um, you want to want to talk about us where differences are and why that's interesting for you. Um, that's one option. Go to the forum. Um, you also can send me an email if there's something very urgent um, from the webinar. Thank you uh, for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, enjoy um, your work with Kamunda with um, BPMN. And yeah, see you sometime again. Thank you, guys.